well, how does this thing work? Right? We need to tell people, how does this thing work? Joseph Redman, he came up with this algorithm. He was a grad student at University of Washington. When you think about, you know, when he's a grad student, you could be him 10 years later, right? Just 10 years. So how YOLO works is, first of all, you have this beautiful picture here. What you do is you split those things into grades. So one of the homework, right, you need to do is actually look at your configuration files and to figure out how many grids we actually have. And then the second thing you need to do is basically for each of these little boxes, okay, let's just say for this box right here, you predict the probability of having object, right? No more or less. It's just predicting whether I have an object or not. Not predicting, for example, whether this is going to be like a bicycle or a dog or a fan. I don't care about that. I'm just trying to get a sense that if this whole region is anything interesting or not. Very simple. Okay. Predict, you know, if there's, there, there's an object in, in, that, in that little box. And then for each of these box, okay, for each of these box, then you see these like diff different boxes. So these boxes are called anchor box. So for each of these box, what are we going to do? is we basically say, okay, maybe, you know, yes, this one has some object, has some object. Okay, if that's the case, then what are we gonna do is for each of these box, we're gonna propose a few anchor boxes, but these anchor boxes can come in different flavors, right? Meaning, you know, can be, some of them can be, you know, big, some of them can be small, some of them can be like, you know, horizontally stretched, some of them can be vertically stretched, right? So the idea is that for these anchor boxes, right, to sort of like, okay, I need to predict an anchor box to predict where, where this object is, right? Given the fact that I know there's an object. Now, Yola also does something smart. That is, once it proposes these anchor boxes, it's only trying to adjust the width and height of the anchor boxes so that it will actually fit the object. So that's step number three. And when you think about, for example, um, the output of Yola, so it's not, for example, you know, in the case where, you know, you have the object localization and object uh, classification, you have two separated losses, right? You add them together. One loss would be the classification loss and the other one would be the localization loss. Whereas for YOLO, the output is something like this. The output is something like this. So that is, first of all, we need to look at the probability of whether it has this object or not. Second is we need to have these guys, X, Y, width and height, and they're essentially governing where the bounding box is. And then we have a whole bunch of things here, which are essentially the probability for each class. So the loss for YOLO is essentially the loss for this guy plus the loss for this category, right? This regression problem for localization and plus for the classification, okay? So three losses come together, one shot, one shot. So to illustrate a little bit more in terms of what is the output look like. So PC is basically the probability whether I have this object or not. So for example, right, for these boxes, for these grids, these are zero because there are no object in here. Let's just say in this case, I'm just going to try to predict three different classes. Could be maybe car or, you know, or a cat or maybe a person. Uh, but in this case, okay, these are zero. But then you can see for this, grid box, right, the yellow one, and this grid box, which are green, you can see we have one here, right? Well, one here, because we know there's object. And then for the ones that doesn't have any, any object, we have these BX, BY, BH, and BW, which are bounding boxes. There are some number, but they're really, really small. We don't really care about them. Also for the class definition, you know, we don't have any of them, right? But then for the one, you know, for example, this guy here, we have these bounding boxes, right? As well as, oh, okay, well, we have these class labels. So do you guys remember in YOLO, this is essentially a YOLO um, configuration file. Do you guys know what are those things? Width and height, what uh, are those? Image dimensions. That's right, image dimensions. What image dimensions though? Boxes, like the boxes that the YOLO divided into. Um, it's basically shrink all the images to this size. Okay, so these are the input neurons. Uh, can I ask you guys how many input neurons we have? Four sixteen squared. Yeah. N times three. Four sixteen squared n times three because of the three channels. You definitely did this. Why do we need to put it the classes numbers here? Classes equal to five. Why do we need to do that? Number of output neurons. That's right. 
number of output neurons, how many number of output neurons we have in this case? Five. It's not five, right? Because remember, this is more than image classification. Okay, so think about this, okay? So you have P object, and what else you have? You have bounding box, X, bounding box, Y, bounding box width, bounding box height, these guys. And you have class one, class two, class three, class four, and class five. In our case, we have five classes, correct? And you know what? We have to repeat these because why do we have to repeat this three times? Let's just say. Do it for every box in the grid. For every anchors, okay? For every anchors, we need that, okay? How many anchor boxes we have? Nine. Ha ha, right? And what are those numbers? What do you think? The size of the anchor boxes, right? Size of the anchor boxes. So the way you do it is you have this image. Let's just say we divide it, you know, three by three, okay, like that. So these are all essentially our grid. For each grid, remember what I said, there are anchor boxes, right? So for, for this guy, maybe I have an anchor box like that, I have an anchor box like that, you know, a fat one, a thin one, right? Maybe another square one, okay? So therefore, each one of these guys are for one anchor box, which is why if, you, if, we go back to, if we go back to the presentation, right? You see this giant thing, right? This giant thing is nothing but a tensor. A tensor is just a fancy way of saying multidimensional matrix. Right, multi-dimensional matrix, and it's really you know composed by all these different matrices with this different content. And all we try to do is basically applying an image going through it, and we know how round we are, and then you know back propagate to optimize the weights. So once we have these boxes, right, we predict a whole bunch of bounding boxes. Remember, for each single you know grid, we can have ten different bounding boxes, and we have to adjust them. Okay, so we have you know, each one of them, we, we know whether it has objects or not, right? And we have these bounding boxes. Then what do we do is we can do a voting, right? So for each grid, right, we can say, oh yeah, you know, maybe, you know, most of the boxes they touch upon, they contain this object. Okay, I'm going to classify them, you know, having this class probability. So remember, this is not about object probability anymore. This is about class probability. So now you can segment these grids, right, into different classes. And then what you do, now you basically have all the bonding boxes. You can sort of like color code them because you know they belong to that object, most likely, right? Most likely. Now you got all this whole graph of different bonding boxes. You know, those ones are not sure because you know what, they're already, you know, bonding boxes can do the job, get rid of them, right? You do the norm, max, suppression. And that's how you can predict, you know, these objects in one single shot. And YOLO is both fast and accurate. So you know, what are we plotting here is AP, right? Average precision, right? average precision versus uh, frame per second. So of course, you know, more frame per second you have, the better, more average precision, the better. So you want to be in this, qu this quarter, right? So this is real time kind of stuff. And you can see here, you know, V3, we're using YOLO V3 right now, uh, it's somewhere here. It's not the best in terms of quality. I would say, you know, YOLO V4 would be better. But you know, remember we worked on this class last year, and that's where we worked on yellow v3. We never had a yellow v4, and this year we had a yellow v4, and look like you know they have about thirty something percent improvement in terms of average precision while maintaining probably maintaining the same speed. Okay, so you can see how fast this field really improves. And my recommendation is, if you are interested in learning about AI, you have to continue to learn to read, and it's really exciting. And if you don't do that, you know, by the time you graduate, you, you thought, oh. You know, um, I learned AI when I was uh, you know, a teenager and I had fun with it. Let me look at it again, right? By that time, we'll be too late because <laughs> you know, this field really flies, right? Really flies. Unlike some of the stuff you're learning in high school, I'm not saying you shouldn't learn that, you should. You know, there's a whole bunch of things you learn in school, they never change, right? Or well, the development has been really slow, but not for AI. I would say for you guys, you wanna make sure your fundamentals are strong first, right? Forget about different algorithms. Start with programming, right? Make sure you're a kick-ass programmer, world-class programmer. Stop thinking about different languages, different frameworks. Make sure you take a problem, you know how to dissect it, you know how to code it, right, from the ground up, and you know how to do testing. Those are the important skills to learn. Once you get the fundamentals, fundamentals should always be on top of your mind. So when I was, for example, even today, uh, I constantly looking for new knowledge about Python. Python is this thing where you can learn pretty fast, you know, up to some point, 
But then there's a whole bunch of section of knowledge, you know, beyond that, you know, it's, it's going to make you an awesome programmer, right? And make your style much better. But these styles or these, these habits is hard to acquire. So that will take years. Hopefully we gave you some confidences in terms of programming. You know, Alan told me, I mean, he's not here right now. I don't know why, but he told me, I know you're here. Okay. Your mom told me you were so happy yesterday, right? Because I figure it's not because of my teaching, but it's because you went on and did something on your own, right? You got those, you know, pages, Catherine design, you implement it. That will give you confidence, right? I would hope you guys would, you know, as I said numerous times, my job, our job, our instructor's job is for you to get rid of us because there's so many knowledge online. If you know how to learn, you will be able to learn those things, right? So you should totally start learning things, you know, that on the internet, right? And really, you know, and also build a, a network, right? Like basically you can only, you know, do better uh, when you're learning with a group of peers who are, you know, also, you know, share the same kind of interest, right? It's very important to find people like that. Beyond object detection, so here we have dense captioning. So this is done, you know, by Professor Fefe Li at Stanford. I tried to get her as a, our advisor, but I, I failed. But, you know, we have, fortunately have Taki Wiseman. Um, so this is essentially, you know, not only you do the object detection, but also you do the captioning. Of course, captioning is also use deep neural networks, right? So you can see here, <laughs> you know, two men standing on the beach, not quite, but, you know, close. The sign is black and white. Uh, I think that's, that's this guy here because this is the blue, right? The sign is actually maybe black and yellow. And the girl holding a frisbee. So saying this part is girl holding a frisbee. I don't know why. It doesn't seem right. A wooden sign. Yep, that's absolutely right. White sign with black writing. So I think that's this guy. Yes. Man holding a white frisbee. <laughs> so I guess I never trained on the surfboard. <laughs> okay. White frisbee in the air. <laughs> that's even funnier. This guy. So, okay. The mist, right? And then the shorts are blue. Yes, the shorts are blue. Okay. A metal pole holding a sign. Okay. Yes, that's a metal pole holding a sign. The sign's yellow. Yes, the sign's yellow. I thought this is brilliant, right? What if you take this whole thing and you know what? I don't know. I always come back to, the, to, to this thing, writing children's story, right? Simplify this, you know? Two best friends standing, standing on the beach, right? They're holding a white frisbee and the shorts are blue. Maybe that's a great children's story. I don't know. <laughs> so those are, you know, pretty fun. Also, we can do instant segmentation where this is, you know, we think about, you know, one object classification, multiple object classification, semantic segmentation, where you just say, you know, uh, you don't distinguish, you know, between each individual object, but you do assign each pixel, you know, a class. And the instance segmentation, oh my gosh, that's even more difficult. You have to see each instance. And for every, in, you know, pixel, you have to assign, right, which instance it belongs to, right? So that's yeah, very high degree kind of, you know, object detection. We can also generate photos. We can generate photos. We can generate really, really realistic photos. So this is beyond object detection. Thank you.